Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology and Raw. I'm really excited about this conversation with Dr. Julia Sadusky. Uh, Julia is a licensed clinical psychologist in Colorado. She's also an author, consultant, speaker, and adjunct professor. Um, she's done extensive research and clinical work in sexual development and specializes in trauma-informed care. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree from Ave Maria University, a master's degree and doctorate in clinical psychology from Regent University. She's written written or co-written several books, including her most recent book, which I have right here uh, for my YouTube followers. You can see it. It says, or the title is, uh, Start Talking to Your Kids About Sex, a practical guide for Catholics. Now, as we discuss at the very end of this conversation, this book is um, also very relevant and helpful for Protestants. So don't let the, if you're not Catholic, don't let the subtitle uh, scare you away. Um, as you'll see, everything we talk about is very relevant, whether you're uh, whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant. Gosh, we we talked about so many things. I mean, on the one hand, we we did get very explicit um, in, in a very, I think, healthy way with how to talk to your kids about sex and our sexed bodies. Um, so we do talk explicitly, and I hate I, I don't want to give a warning because the whole point of why we talk explicitly is because we should talk explicitly um, and uh, with our kids. So I, I don't want to say if your young kids aren't around, you know, maybe, maybe if you have young kids around that you haven't had these conversations with, then maybe um, put your earbuds in, listen to this, and then turn right around and, and start having more um, open and honest conversations with your kids about this really important topic. So without further ado, please welcome to the show for the first time, the one and only Dr. Julia Sadeski. All right. Hey, Julia, thanks so much for uh, being a guest on Theology in a Row. I apologize again for being late, uh, which my audience doesn't know about until now, but <laughs> I rarely show no up late worries. to my own Theology in a Row interviews, and here I am uh, several minutes late. But thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, not a problem. So um, I well, t- tell us briefly just who you are, what you do, and then I really want to get into this topic that you wrote a book about, uh, how to talk to your kids about sex, because I get asked this question all the time. So I'm excited to uh, learn from you over the next hour or so. But yeah, tell us who Julia Sadeski is. Yeah, so I am a licensed psychologist in Colorado. Um, I've been here since about 2019, and I have a private practice here now. Um, I've done work as a psychologist in sexuality and gender, tons of research in that area over the course of my career, and have written a couple of books specifically on gender. And then this new book is a little bit more broad, just talking about human sexuality and faith and how to form children in, in a healthy vision of sexuality. And so, uh, I speak, I write, I do clinical work, which is my primary passion. And, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. I was going to ask you what your favorite part of what you do is. Is it the clinical work? Is that what you love the most? Yes. Yes. It's the clinical work. I never would have thought I would have done anything other than that because I just wanted to be in a room alone with people doing what I do in therapy. And so it's been quite the journey to be able to do other things and super surprising to me. It takes a certain kind of person, right? Because I think most people I know think about people doing clinical work or counselors, you know, they're just like, Every hour, every a couple of hours, you're meeting with a new person that typically has stuff they're working through. You know, like it's not a, it's a weighty conversation, and most people find that absolutely exhausting. But there is a select <laughs> few, the chosen <laughs> of humanity, that actually is energized by that. What what does it take to do what you do? Because I think, yeah, for me, that sounds like I could do that for about. I could do like one a day, maybe, you know, like, (laughs) yeah, I always say to people, my job is very different than most jobs on the face of the earth. You know, you're asking people to step into the depths with you on purpose. You know, I'm choosing to to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's interesting. I, I found myself even as a young child, kind of drawn to people, uh, and wanting to, have deeper conversations with people. And I have always enjoyed one-on-one context or small group contexts to just go deeper. And um, I remember my first job out of out of undergrad was at a rehab and I was a behavioral health technician, kind of entry level position. And I kept finding myself sitting one-on-one with people and just hearing their stories. And it was the final step for me that confirmed, yeah, mm-hmm. that this is what I want to do. And um yeah, what does it take? I mean, I, I think it does take a lot of discipline in listening to my body. I have a therapist, mm-hmm. uh, you know, who shows up for me and, you know, okay. just being able to um, find ways to step in and out of the uh, intensity of of people's lives, which, yeah, is definitely a discipline. How, how do you not take 
I, I, I don't want to use the wrong language, but like their mm -hmm. problems. I don't know. Can I say that? How do you take someone's, mm -hmm. the stuff they're working through? How do you not take that with you? Like, say you, you, you're meeting with somebody and, and maybe they're wrestling with suicidality. They're just, they got so much going on. And it's like, oh my word. And then, hey, I got another meeting. So we're done and, you know, move on. And like, how, how do you do that? And then go home and like live a normal life. I think that's the biggest question people have. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the number one question people ask me. I, so. <laughs> maybe it's surprising, but I, I don't know that there's a way to just not be impacted by people's stories. Yeah. If there is, I have not found it. And it's been more characteristic of my work that I actually want to be impacted by the lives of the people I walk mm. with, which means there are days where I come home and I'm carrying the weight of somebody's mm. suicidality, as you mentioned, or, um, you know, know that somebody's weighing a difficult decision that week. And it's, it's on my mind and it's on my heart. And, um, I would say prayer has been really important for that, you know, surrendering the people I walk with to God as a spiritual discipline, um, going into activities that are distracting for me. You know, I used to live with a family with kids. So going home and when you're around kids, you know, <laughs> your focus yeah. is on them, not on what just happened. So just finding ways to shift, go, go to the gym, be outside, shift my awareness into mm -hmm. a different direction has been helpful because, yeah, I'm not the kind of therapist who is not impacted and, and it, it's not always clean to be able to step out of it. I would say it's, it's just kind of my yeah. honest take. Gosh, my 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 my, view, my high view of you already just went higher. That that's an amazing response. That's golly, I can imagine. Yeah, that that it has. I'm sure drawn you closer to Jesus. I mean, um, it's very Jesus like, right? To sit in people's pain and 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 stuff they're working through, and and to almost let it let it bother bother you in a good way and yet not cripple you in a bad way that's somebody said if yes. you have almost too much empathy you probably wouldn't make a you'd make a good therapist for that hour people would love it you would just be in there weeping with them you know but like you just you could just it'd be like sprinting and trying to sprint through a marathon you just you just collapse after a couple miles you know right um, right wow um, well let's jump into your book so you you, you recently wrote this book uh start talking to, start talking to your kids about sex I love how it's in the command <laughs> um what led you to want to write this book because you you don't have kids right you're not uh that's right uh, yeah yeah, yeah. No kids. so what what drove you to want to write this book yeah so it's it's such a funny story I was actually uh talking with Abby Maria press the um publisher about a totally different project. And so I was pitching something around sexual orientation uh, to educate Catholics. And um, I wrote that proposal. I wrote the sample chapter. You know, you know how it goes. All the things were in and their meeting got delayed a month, uh, the publishing meeting for that book project. And so in that month, I had gotten probably five or six calls from close friends asking questions about young children and how to respond to questions they were getting or experiences in the home, you know, uh, play dates that kind of went wonky at some point. And, and they kept saying, as I would script things for them, here's what you can say. Here's how you can pick up that conversation with your kid. They, I, they kept saying to me, why isn't there a book on this? Why isn't there a book on this? And so, um, as I sat with that, uh, you know, it, it's happened before where that has been said to me and I'm like, well, I guess I could write a book about that, you know? And so I, I prayed about it a little bit. And then I started to really think about the work I do with, um, people who have survived sexual trauma in childhood. And I've always been struck by how there are certain proactive things we are not doing in Christian context that we could be doing that would buffer against sexual abuse. And so it was really the convergence of those two mm. pieces, friends asking me questions about early childhood development and pondering what could be uh, more helpful in this space um, to buffer against some of the harm against children today. And so those two things came together and I emailed the editor and said, wait, <laughs> I, I want to write another uh, proposal and wrote a sample chapter in about an hour. So it really flowed out of me and, um, that that's how it came to be. Let, let's go uh, real quick, big picture stuff. And, and then mm -hmm. I would love to walk through, um, cause I know you talk about different age stages throughout the book. Um, Let's go big picture. What are some big picture things that any parent with a younger, say they have a, a one-year-old kid. So, so they're not having these conversations probably yet, um, or maybe they are. I'll 
lets you talk. Um, but they're thinking long term. Okay, I want I want to do this right. Um, what what are some big picture things you would tell that parent to some big picture do's and don'ts in terms of having these conversations with younger kids? Yeah. So the first thing is, and, and I start the book this way, is what are the things that get in the way of well-intentioned parents having conversations with their kids in developmentally appropriate ways? Um, because I sit with a lot of parents and have m- many friends who will say, gosh, I want to do it differently than how it was done for me. I want to be able to respond in a calm way. But I actually in the moment don't. And so um, being able to help parents look at their own stories and say, what were the messages that I got about sexuality through the absence of conversation or what happened when there was conversation? What did I take away from that? And recognizing really for for parents themselves, oh my gosh, these things are going to present some type of barrier for me. So what are going to be my blind spots or what are going to be the things that really put the heat on me? Because if you can plan for some of that, um, you start to realize, oh, these are my strengths. These are my areas of comfort. And these are the things that feel hot button to me. Um, and maybe there's there's room for parents to work with a therapist on some of those pieces or to have a close friend that they can start to talk about this or their spouse that they can talk about this with. And so that's really the first thing is... Uh, why are we as well-intentioned adults um, not able when the moment comes to really intervene? Uh, the, The second thing is being able to take ownership over what we've already done or not done, right? So you mentioned the one-year-old. At that point, not a lot has happened in this space. There, There is one thing you can start doing, and this is uh, kind of hilarious to me because really it's for the parents. It's not for the babies and kids, but at bath time and when you're changing their diaper to be able to start to name their genitalia out loud. Um, It's something that in sex therapy we do actually as we're training as clinicians, we practice saying genitalia out loud and not laughing or not, you know, letting shame get in the way, not blushing. Because as a clinician, you have to talk about these things quite a bit with people, especially if you're a sex therapist. And so I use that type of intervention for parents to say, okay, yeah, when when they're one and you're cleaning uh, their um, genital area, you can say, oh, I'm going to clean your vagina now. I'm going to clean your vulva area. And all of that is simply for the parents to help reduce shame, increase comfort. And just like we teach kids other body parts, teaching them um, initially about uh, those parts of the body uh, so that there's less shame around that. Is that so? That's that's the purpose. Is is if something's not named, then it's very easy to be to that thing that's not named to become a source of shame l- later on. And has that been shown? Like, has that been shown cl- clinically and through studies and stuff? I mean, it seems yeah. it seems intuitively correct to me. It's like, yeah, if you can't even talk about something, then mm-hmm. that's gonna be like, oh, this must be a bad thing, you know. That's right. So so it's actually the number one buffer against uh, childhood sexual abuse is if parents really? teach their kids about their genitalia, the, the names, the accurate terms for genitalia oh. is protective against abuse in childhood. And so... Um, And then what, right, if your child does experience an unwanted sexual experience, how do they talk about it with you? Because they're already going to feel shame about the experience. And then Mm -hmm. if this body part has never been given language or has never been uh, given any type of attention other than don't touch that or don't talk Mm -hmm. about that or uh, don't point at that, right, It, it carries a connotation that is an additional barrier. And and that's something that, yes, through research we can know, but also through clinical practice, it's something that anecdotally a lot of people say is, my parents never talked about this area of the body. And then when something happened to it, I was really left to my own devices and I got Mm. the sense it wasn't okay to tell anybody about it. Wow. That's fascinating. I mean, it's, 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 I've never heard anybody say it just like that, but it's so intuitive. Like, I think everybody listening is like, oh yeah, I mean, it totally makes sense. Like, Right. Um, so that are you saying that's like so? Let's go zero to two. Is that kind of mm-hmm. where you want to start naming body parts? Um, that's and then right. That's, but beyond that, zero to two, there's probably nothing more you need to do at that point. Well, so then, then we get into right like three to five, three to seven, okay. and again for people with learning disabilities or a- sure. other pieces going on developmentally, it wouldn't quite map this way, but. Um, for kind of neurotypical kids, you're going to start to see something called exploratory play. And this is broader than just around uh, anatomy and genitalia. You know, kids start to play games uh, in a 
sensory way, right? That their sensory experience, touching things, um, making sounds, all of these things becomes ways that they're learning about their environment. And we start to see kids do the same thing with their bodies. They start to notice their changing body uh, when, you know, uh, things move around or when they, when they touch different parts of the body, they're curious about it. And this is where we start to hear kids playing games like doctor and, and kind of noticing, you know, a little boy touching his penis and saying, oh my gosh, like, look, what's that? Why is that moving? Why is that sticking out? Or uh, a little girl pointing at a boy's or her own and saying, oh, mine's different from yours, right? Or mom, why do I look like you and not dad, right? These kinds of uh, more typical developmental pieces. And so these are moments that parents tend to get really reactive and scared. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times what I hear from families and what we know from research is that parents, again, will respond the way they were responded to. So if, if an adult as a child touched their own genitals or somebody else's out of curiosity and they got slapped, right? Mm. Well, you, you might do the exact same thing to your kid or, or throw their hand away, that kind of thing. And so Actually, part of the book is also just coaching parents through what is normative uh, exploratory play and how do you set boundaries with kids about that? So it's not just, oh, that's normal. So you don't do anything. You just let them touch each other and touch themselves. No, it's like, how do you actually coach the parents on engaging, setting limits with the kids in a kind of warm, winsome, calm way? And so there's a lot of scripting about that as well. How do you so when you say boundaries, you're you're saying like innocent, curious touching of somebody else, and then how yes. do you not shame them for doing that, but also protect the boundaries? Say, say it's your kid that's doing that again, very curiously and innocently, whatever. Um, so how do you go? But yeah, how do you go about? Yeah, um, setting boundaries without shaming them. Yeah. So, and it's both for them touching somebody else's body, you know, without permission and without that being appropriate and also for themselves, right? That there are differences between public environments and private environments. And um, so coaching through that. So what's an example of that? Let's say, um, you know, you're at church on Sunday and one of your sons is, he's four and he's just playing with his penis, right? He's just touching it and kids do this. And, um, you know, you could in the moment just just remind him and say, you know, uh, do you want me to hold your hand? I, I can tell that you're kind of distracted. Um, and and uh, later then, right? And it's best with kids when they're playing with you or you're kind of doing something together instead of sitting down, staring them in the face and saying, we need to talk about what happened at church. Um, but just, you know, if you're if they're helping you, uh, I don't know, uh, clean some dishes in the kitchen or whatever it might be. and um, just around, you can say, Hey, I noticed you were touching your penis at church today. Um, what do you like about doing that? Uh, and you're just opening the conversation and the kid's going to tell you, Oh, it feels funny or it feels, um, good to me or, um, or I don't know. I don't know why I like doing that. Right. And, and the parent can say, well, you know, um, that is a part of your body that we want to keep really clean. And so if we touch our hands, which have germs on them, on that part of the body, uh, it can actually uh, cause germs and and has a kind of infection. So we're not going to touch that, especially in public, but we touch it when we clean it. We touch it when we're in the bath, um, when we're wiping it, when, you know, to go to the bathroom. Other than that, we're going to keep our hands um, in our lap. So you're kind of, framing it in a positive way. Here's what, and you're always telling kids, here's what we do with our hands. And here's what we do with that part of the body. You're starting to already teach the function of it, right? What's it for? It was well, not actually for play. Um, it's, it's for other uh, purposes. And so you're just starting to set that framework at that point. Okay. So this is uh, the three to seven ish range. Mm-hmm. That's right. So you're not at, at that age, I guess this is the getting into another question. Um, you're not talking about the sexual function of genitalia or are you let, let's i guess that's a, uh, let me ask you that question when do you start talking about um this is, this is probably the number one question i get like when do we start talking mm-hmm. about ki- our kids about sex i'm in the title of your, of your book in an age appropriate way like i don't want to introduce categories too early and yet i think most parents now well a lot of parents now are realizing we typically wait too long our parents waited too long you know sit us down we're like 17 to have sex sex talk you know <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's right. Like so and, awkward. It's like, and now with the internet and everything, everything is so much like they're hearing about stuff so much younger. So it's like, 
it has to be younger. But what does that look like? So what? Yeah, what yeah. is the age appropriate way to start talking about sex with your kids? Yeah. So we we honestly don't have any research to tell us when you start actually having that conversation. Really, mm-hmm. what you're basing it on is exposure to uh, technology, social media, peers who would be talking about it. Because the way I frame it in the book is that you do not want to be the last person setting a framework for this conversation. You want to be seen if you're a parent, if you're a mentor in somebody's life as a resource, right? A source of wisdom, just like we want people to see God as a source of wisdom in this uh, conversation. And so if you're the last or, you know, 10th person to have a place at the table, uh, what's going to happen is what we've seen happen, which is kids have one awkward conversation with their parents at puberty, and they never want to talk about it with mom and dad again. Um, And so what the way I think about it and talk about it in the book is, you know, you're basing the actual sex talk off of um, exposure, but you're also beginning to anticipate as kids get a little bit older, seven, eight, nine, you know, once they're in school, that they're going to hear these things from their friends. And so uh, I'll tell you this story. One of my, um, one of my friends uh, got this book and and had it sitting on her table. And uh, one of her kids came up and said, mom, what's sex? Right. And she's about eight. And uh, so that's the first conversation. So when do you do it? You do it when the child asks that question at eight. Um, So the first conversation and and what did the child uh, hear from mom? Well, sex is actually uh, one, one meaning of that is uh, that there are two sexes. There are men and there are women. And uh, that's one definition of sex. There's other things it means, and we'll talk about that as you get older. But one one thing it means is you know how you're a, a girl and and dad's a man and I'm a woman. That's that's sex. Um, so so you can see that just keeping it really precise, and then it, hey, if if you hear other things about that word, you know you'll probably hear friends talk about it. You'll hear teachers at some point talk about it. Uh, you can always bring that home and just tell us what you're learning about sex because we can talk about that more. So you're priming the kid to bring those conversations back into the home environment and helping them know they are going to hear other things about sex and and, and what's going to happen. A kid's going to say, oh, sex is when two people get naked and, and, you know, they do, they do bad things or whatever they say. (laughs) And then you want that kid coming to mom and dad and saying, Hey, I heard another thing about sex. Like, let's talk about that. Oh, actually there is another meaning of sex. Remember we talked about that, right? So you're just planting these seeds and and the biggest thing is showing calm because if the kid can sniff out that you yeah. are freaking out, yeah. they will protect the parent. We see this all the time from young oh, children, wow. especially empaths. If they can tell their parents are uncomfortable or angry or overwhelmed, they will log that and say, you know what? It's more important for me to have the attachment with you than to talk about this thing. So I'm not going to put my mom and dad through something uncomfortable. That's interesting. Wow. I've not, I've not heard that. Um, so you kind of let the kid again, I'm, I'm thinking, let's just say five to eight ish, you know, five to nine when, when they're starting to be in more public settings or around other kids or out in the getting out in the world a little bit. Um, you're kind of letting their curiosity mm-hmm. drive the when and how would you say? Like if, if they're not asking, they're out playing. Like, I, you know, I, I think of you different kids you know some kids are just super curious really early and it's like gosh you tell you can they're just really curious other kids are just like you know i don't want to stereotype boys and girls but like in in, mm-hmm. in my situation is you know I, like my, it was it was that you know and like my you know b- boys are just like just running around the on the ball field you know playing around and stuff and they're just they're just not really interested where, where girls seem to be a little bit more uh interested you're letting their interest kind of guide the when and how is that yeah, to some ex- okay. to some extent. Yeah, I mean, I think at the same time, right? If you have in many families, you have kids of different ages, and so mm. you do have to be also helping the most curious kids know what to do with the information they're getting from you. Because mm-hmm. if they're curious, they may also feel confident in their ability to know things. And so, you know how this can be with kids is yeah. they'll then be the resource to all their friends and want to, you know, <laughs> I, I get to tell everybody. And so, you're also helping that child know that, okay, 
uh, you know, you're curious about this. We're going to talk about this. This is actually something that we get to talk about the two of us. And with, you know, if, if you're married to another person, your, your other parent, like we get to talk about this in our home. We don't talk about this with younger siblings. We don't talk about this with friends. Why? Because that's a conversation I want to have with them. Just like I've been able to have important, mm. special conversations with you. So you're, you're bracketing it with the kids who are more curious now with other things like young boys, as they get older, they will start to notice things like erections. Sure. Right. And, and so if you're noticing that you're going to, you're going to step in, even if they're not uh, okay. bringing that up. So, so if you notice them having an erection, you may again, not, not really say anything in the moment, come back to it later when everything's more calm and, and just say, Hey, I noticed that your, your penis was sticking up. Did you notice that? Does that happen sometimes for you? Oh, what do you think of that? And then you're getting, again, you're always getting their reaction first because they're going to tell you more if you don't fill the space. And then coming in as a parent and saying, um, oh, that's actually really normal. That's that's happening because blood is rushing to that area of your body. Sometimes it happens for no reason. Sometimes it happens um, for a reason. And we we can talk about that more as time goes on. But very normal, you know, if it ever is painful to you, if you ever notice uh, like swelling there that that scares you, we can we can talk about that. So you're just, again, pointing them back, helping coach them in the least intrusive way. And then you're asking them at the end, what, what other questions do you have? And they may say none. And, and maybe in your experience, you know, your, your boy wouldn't, wouldn't have any other questions. Like I'm on to the next thing. Um, but <laughs> then they know who to go to when they do have yeah. questions. And we're assuming they might at some point uh, as, as things start to develop more. You're just kind of normalizing the conversation, right? Is that I, I hear you totally. saying just like constantly just nor that this is just a normal, you know, like what's for dinner and I had an erection, yeah. you know, like it's just kind of yes. um so it's not an awkward thing when when more questions arise. If I can I, I do wanna so even in that situation, and I don't I mean this is the Algen Ross. We 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 have a very long leash on on how specific and graphic we want to get. So but I, I don't wanna, you know, go further than we need to, but even something like that, like like I mean, there's a really specific sexual function with with what's going on there, right? Like, but you yeah. you're saying you don't need to get into the the nitty gritty details of why all this blood's rushing to your penis, whatever. I mean, because um, you can right. just kind of there there is it okay to be more general? Because I think that's the tension. People are like, gosh, how specific do I get? I don't yeah. want to I don't want to be the prude parent, you know, and like not even talk about it, you know, whatever. But then also like, how specific do I get? Do I start talking about what? the sex act look like, you know, to a 10 year old or whatever, or is that like going too far? How, how do you balance that? Yeah, it's, it's so challenging. And I, I think part of it is for parents to attune to your specific kid. Right. Okay. So, so I've had some parents who, you know, their kids are homeschooled, they're not on social media and their peer group is pretty, um, able to filter out a lot of content. So if they're eight, eight years old, they're not likely to be exposed to much of anything at that point if they're not accessing devices. You know, it, gone are the days where they're going into uh, um, get magazines, right, that have pornographic yeah. <laughs> content or that kind of thing. So so it's a little bit different in, in every case. However, um, once you start to hit eight, nine, 10 for boys and girls, they're going to start to notice uh, you know, probably crushes a little bit more. They're going to start to have erections more in response to stimulus, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. they, you know, I've had, had clients who say, you know, I was climbing a tree and, and I've experienced an erection from just the touch of the tree. And yeah. I wish somebody had told me, you know, at about that age, nine or 10, that that could happen because it scared me. And it also mm -hmm. felt really good and it felt really confusing. And, I definitely didn't bring it up to my parents because I they had never talked about that before. And so anyway, I, I think what we're trying to do is once we get eight, nine, ten, and that's really the second book of this series, this the talking with your teens about sex is uh, about that age nine to ten, where you do start to describe function. And like, do you ever wonder, and and this is the question, you know, do you ever wonder why it is that blood rushes to your penis at that time, right? Um, or for young girls, as they get older, you know, discharge of, of the vaginal area. Do you ever wonder about that? And uh, that's where you start to say, well, that actually has a really cool purpose. <laughs> mm. And and if your kid is curious and, um, 
you know, you get to say you, what questions do you have about that? Or you can say, have you ever heard about um, sex? Have you ever heard about, what do you know about that? What have your friends said about that? What have you read online? Because some kids will, you know, already search things up even without you knowing or looked in an encyclopedia if they don't have social media. Um, so kids, all, well, all kinds of things. Going through a cycle, a cycle <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's dating us, right? It's like, do yeah. they have this anymore? <laughs> um, but yeah, what, whatever it is, so you're you're pooling that thread. What do they know? And then and then you can start to say, well, actually, the purpose of that is it's what helps a, a woman become a mom and, and a husband become a dad. And and you can speak to the procreative dimension of that. You can speak to the unitive, right? That that you know, when people become adults and when they, you know, some people get married, many people get married, and. Um, sex actually becomes the highest way that they show love to one another. And so, so again, you can keep that general and then you can show diagrams. I mean, the whole, the second book has images of diagrams that you start to point out to kids as they're in puberty. And uh, it's a little different than the approach that I've seen in recent years, which is you give your kids a book. Uh, mm. I kind of like the idea of you being the one communicating it and showing I can have this conversation, even giving a kid a book, I think in some ways can say, go do that yourself. <laughs> I don't know how to talk about that with you. And I, I would love for parents by the time puberty comes to feel really free to say, oh, I want to be the one that explains this to you. Look, this is the male reproductive system. This is the female reproductive system. Remember how we've talked about how penises can become erect? That's actually on purpose uh, for the sexual act. And again, you can get as descriptive as uh, you need to with an older child about that. So you're talking right now, you're still in the prepubescent stage, right? You're, That's you're, right. You're That's eight, right. 10, 11. I mean, you're not, you're not talking 13, 14 by then you're having full on sex talks, I'm sure, right? I mean, exactly, exactly, okay. and 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 it may depend on the kid, but really, at the end of the day, by that time, my sense is that the the parents who take this approach, their kids are wanting to talk at mm. puberty about things they're noticing at school, online, um, misinformation <laughs> about sexuality. You know, yeah. um, even in today. Uh, culture, you know, BDSM stuff, like kids are going to, I want them to go home at 13 and say, I heard this thing at school about, you know, hitting are they somebody. Hearing about, are they hearing about BDSM stuff in school? Like, I, oh, yes. Yeah. It depends on the school, but oh, yeah. Sure. Um, and, and with pornography, right? I mean, yeah. they've seen, uh, you know, I think average exposure for pornography is seven to nine. And, you know, you figure that algorithm by the time you get to 13, 14, you can see a lot of things. So, um, so that's what I hear about, right? I hear about the kids who are telling me what they wouldn't tell their parents, which is, this is what I heard. This is what I saw. What mm. is that? Um, you know, through, uh, anime, those kinds of things as well. This episode is sponsored by Kuva, an innovative streaming service that helps you understand scripture the way it was intended to be understood, complexities and all. Kuva helps you dig deep into scripture, original original languages, the, and the biblical context with series, documentaries, roundtables, and much, much more from experienced Christian leaders and teachers. For instance, they have one series titled Powerful and Kind, a study of Genesis 1 to 3. They've got another series devoted to understanding the concept of the kingdom of God. There's a lengthy roundtable discussion on uh, discussing the nature of revival. It's titled, What is Revival? Which seems super interesting, maybe even controversial, and many other topics and passages that they discuss. Honestly, Kuva resonates so much with the heart of the Elgin Ra because uh, they don't just tell you what to think, but how to think. They, they help you wrestle honestly with God's word for yourself. So Kuva is not gonna spoon feed you all the right answers. Rather, they're gonna make space for you to ask and contemplate the hard questions of faith and find hope in the way. So go beyond Sunday morning sermons. Uh, with videos that cultivate wonder and delight in God. Start streaming today at kuva.tv. That's Q-A-V-A dot TV and get your first month free when you use the code free month. So sign up today for free. When it comes to reading and understanding the Bible, my number one piece of advice is to read the whole Bible over and over and over. It's so important to gain a good view of the forest before you analyze the trees. But sometimes reading the whole Bible can be really daunting. I mean, not only is it like a really large book, but let's face it, some parts can be super hard to understand. 
This is why I'm so excited about the Bible Recap, a one-year guide to reading and understanding the entire Bible by Tara Lee uh, Cobble, a friend of mine who I had on the podcast not too long ago, episode 1067. So the Bible Recap takes you through the whole Bible, and, it, and then it explains each day's study in short two-page summaries of each portion of Scripture that you just read. And what I love most about the Bible Recap is that it's focused on what each section of Scripture reveals to us about the person and work of God. So it doesn't fall into like human-centered moralism. It keeps the focus on what the Bible tells us about God. In fact, a couple of my kids are actually going to be trying to read through the whole Bible this next year, and they're going to also be going through the Bible Recap alongside their yearly uh, Bible reading. Uh, Terry Lee Cobble, uh, the author of the Bible Recap, I mean, she's awesome. She's a relentless researcher when it comes to scripture and a, a super clear and engaging writer. Uh, and she's also the host of the super popular The Bible Recap podcast. Um, so yeah, I would invite you to go check out uh, Theology and Raw episode 1067, where I had an awesome conversation with Terry Lee Cobble and you can hear her heart for uh, God and scripture. Um, so I highly recommend buying The Bible Recap for yourself. Uh, or for someone you know that's wanting to wrap their mind and heart around the storyline of scripture, just go to thebiblerecap.com to find out more. That's thebiblerecap.com. Let's talk about, because you've dealt with a lot of ab- abuse survivors. So how how um, how do we guard against that? What what can we do as parents? Let's just maybe go back and, and you can start at any age you want. And you've already hit on some of it, you know, uh, um, mm-hmm. reducing shame and body parts from an early age, um, boundaries and so on. But are there other things parents can do to help prevent abuse from happening? Because it's so, it's, it's really, it's just, it, it, it just sh- breaks my heart. This is an understatement when I hear the percentages on this, you know, yeah. like. Oh my God. What, what, I mean, what it's something 20 to 30% of females will experience unwanted sexual advances by the tender yeah. 18 or something like that. I mean, is that, is, that's a general is, is that's right. Boys, yeah, one is in, I think far... it's one in four, one in four girls. Oh, and, really? um, and what's interesting is, you know, I think it's like 20% of that group. It will happen before the age of seven. And then oh, the majority wow. will happen between seven and 12. So think about that, right? Even before you're typically having your wow. sex talk, your kids are getting, and the way I frame it, which is not entirely, right? it's quite a reframe. It's like they're getting an education from somewhere. Mm. And, and what I hear from abuse survivors is my first experience of sexuality was with a perpetrator. Like, like what does that mean to me? You know? And it's so, it's so painful for people. And so, yeah, I think, and this is such a passion of mine, totally separate from the work I do more broadly in sexuality and gender, but gosh, in Christian contexts, we can do better. And how do we do better? Right. And that's what you're asking. And and yes, so accurate language for genitalia. Um, Teaching those boundaries around touch, like Uh, The way I frame it in the book is family rules. Like, what are our family rules? And one of our family rules is we don't keep secrets. So we may have surprises. Surprises are okay, but secrets are not. Um, Why? Because I know enough about perpetrators from my work to know that that is something they will say to kids. This is our secret. Um, So so as soon as Mm. that priming is happening, right, uh, in, in in a perpetrator kind of dynamic. I want that child to remember what mom and dad said, we don't keep secrets and to go Mm. to mom and dad and say, Oh, (laughs) so-and-so said this to me because it, it doesn't often, it's not often the case that, um, unwanted sexual experiences are one-offs. I mean, sometimes it is, but it's usually people the family knows, and it's usually people who are in some type of way grooming and building a relationship with these kids. So another thing uh, that you can do to prevent abuse, which feels so small, but is so important and a little bit awkward for parents is you do not force your kids to uh, show physical affection to people in certain ways. I was going to ask that the the go hug yep. go hugger whatever nope. yeah. yeah and and this is not a place to like shame parents listening who say oh I've done that my whole life I've forced my yeah. kids but but the first I learned about this was I was running a um, trauma survivors group and uh, 
we were talking about that idea of politeness and how they all got the message that they had to be polite when somebody asked something of them with their body. And they remember being told to hug or kiss or sit on the lap of a family member who was uh, going to eventually violate them or had already uh, sexually violated them. And they got the sense that my parent wants me to do this because the person wants me to do this. And so, and what I mean by that is that when a person says, give me a hug, the parent says, give them a hug, give them a hug. And the kid is learning. It's my job to do what they're asking me to do. And my parents redirecting me to do that. And so they would learn, oh my gosh, like I'm just doing what I'm told and that's good actually. It's good to listen to the adult when they say sit on my lap, when they say to do these other things, even if I feel uncomfortable. I'm not supposed to listen to them, the discomfort. So, what do you do? <laughs> to yeah, not be rude. Good- <laughs> right? <laughs> to not be rude to people and especially, I mean, so many people don't know this stuff at this point. Right, and so yeah. you're not shaming people, you're not snapping at somebody and saying, you know, how dare you <laughs> ask that of my yeah. kid. Um If you hear somebody at a family gathering uh, say, hey, give me a hug, you can say, oh, in our family, we can give hugs, we can wave, we can smile, we we can do lots of things to say hello and goodbye. So what do you want to do to say hello, goodbye? To aunt so and so, right? Um, so you're like you're, you're saying say that, that in the moment, like uh, in the moment. That's right. Your grandparents, give me a hug. And you're like, oh, we yeah. have and do you so do you turn to your kid and say, Do you want to give a hug or do you want to give a hi or bye? Like, what do you want to do? Exactly. Exactly. What do you want to do? Do you want to wave? Do you want to smile? Do you want to give a high five? Do you want to give a hug? Whatever you want. Because it's not bad for kids to give hugs to people. That's not it. But you're teaching a kid that if they, what you want, right, for that developing adult Mm -hmm. (laughs) is for them to learn that I get to check in with my body and what it's telling me, uh, like my fear response, my discomfort, my disgust response, what it's telling me about this person. I want to grow confidence in my gut. And that's the thing that gets pushed past when it's, you have to do this because we want to look polite or we want to look like we have respectful kids who do what they're told, Uh, which what I hear from parents is some of what the fear is, is I don't want to come across as my kid being rude. And so I force them to do these things and I want them to show affection for a person who's important to me. Um, and, and you can also do that proactively again. I mean, this is ideal is that if you're going to a a Christmas this year, Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you're going to see family members that the kid does not know very well and is not familiar with, you're teaching them, Hey, remember we're going to see so-and-so we can do lots of different things. You can go up and give them a high five. You can give them a hug. If you, if you feel comfortable, you can smile, you can wave. Just remember that, you know, sometimes people ask for hugs. You don't have to give a hug, um, but you don't have to be rude about it. You can just wave or do something else. Right. Um, and then just remember, you know, we keep doors open when we go over to people's houses and, uh, you know, if, if anything happened that that makes you feel, uh, scared or weird, uh, even with family, uh, we want to know about it. And, and those are the things that far ride over, um, or on the plane ride, you can talk about that's cueing in that kid and priming them without saying some people sexually abuse people to a four-year-old, right? You don't have to say yeah, that, right, yeah. but you're trying to get at the emotional experience they're going to push past if they don't know what it, what it's for. That is a hard balance of like helping your kids to be sober and aware uh, that the, yeah, there, there's bad people out there and I want you to be alert. I want you to be, but without being terrified of every person that they're all pedophiles, you know, running around like that's, that's right. such a hard balance, you know, and I don't, yeah. Um, right. It's it's so difficult for parents and you don't want to p- project that onto kids, the paranoia of people. Mm-hmm. And some parents do. Some parents who have experienced abuse will project onto their kids fear. Mm-hmm. We don't have sleepovers because bad things happen at sleepovers would be a way mm-hmm. to do that. Right. Um, so, so there's ways to talk about. We don't. And I, so, you know, I, might, I, might, I might agree with that. I don't know too many sleepovers that well, produce yeah, all kinds of moral, like great things at the end. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's that. I know I talk in the book like you can you can just skip sleepovers and be fine. Here's how you explain that to a kid. Yeah. Like, we don't do sleepovers. That's just a family rule. Uh, yeah. You sleep in your bed in your own home. You can go over to people's houses. But again, once you get into these categories of good, bad, danger, yeah. Uh, yeah. it can it can lead to this kind of arousal in a kid where they can become more mm. vigilant in, in a way that 
is not necessary. Uh, the hypervigilance mm -hmm. doesn't actually prevent harm, mm -hmm. right? But being sober does. Being aware of your body does. We didn't. We didn't do sleepover. We just nipped that in the bud at the beginning, and and not and we didn't. I don't think we produced a bunch of fear. Just like yeah, there's, we don't do that from the very from the very beginning. So so then just kind of never asked. They just. Right. You know, when they got invited, they're like, yeah, we, sorry, we don't, we don't do that. <laughs> so. That's right. Well, and see, Preston, like even I just. I think back of my sleepovers in Harmony. Oh my gosh. Like I, I, there wasn't one time <laughs> when it was like, I walked away, like not being exposed to something or just like you, you pump a mm -hmm. bunch of hormone crazed kids full of sugar and lack of parental yeah. oversight. And it's just not going to go well. I'm sorry. Right. Right. Call me old I, school. Um, I am with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> I, so with that, with those percentages and the ages, going back to the one in every four experience an unwanted sexual contact, I mean, some of that could be unintentional, right? Somebody could not be intending anything, but just doing something, you know, the, the classic Joe Biden sniffing girl's hair or whatever, you know, like, mm -hmm. it's like, I just kind of what boomers do sometimes, you know, they just like, um, I should have, not just boomers, but a lot of people do, but I mean, there's different generations where like, yeah, mm -hmm. just like, yeah, you go get the hug, do this, whatever. And it's just no, no one's intending it. But I think now we're looking back and seeing like, well, some of that is making people feel uncomfortable, even if you're not intending that. So some of it's intentional, some of it's not, but I'm still, Julia, help me get my mind around this high percentage. And does that mean that there's a much higher percentage of people who are pedophiles or struggle with whatever pedophilic desires or whatever? Like, is that, I mean, cause I, we typically think like that's such a rare thing, you know, but is it not that rare? And why is it not that? Like, what's going on? I don't. Yeah. Well, so, so I think of it less in the realm of like, and this is right. We've often thought who are the pedophiles and how do we yeah. identify them? And surely we'll know who they are. So the, so the first thing is to know that again, if most people abusing children who are adults are friends of the family or family members, people the parents know and trust already. That means we're not as good at picking up these individuals as we thought. Right. Yeah. So, so part of it is that we have to contend with, there are more people with sociopathic tendencies and intention to harm vulnerable people than we care to admit. And they're really? in our okay. communities. Yes. Now, do we know the percentage of that? No, I would say that we, we tend to think of pedophilia as rare. I think in my clinical work, I, uh, it would be a rare presenting challenge for somebody to come in and talk about it. So we don't have good data then on who's who, because most we don't have, do we have data come. on percentages? Is it 1%? Is it 20% of humanity or is it, we just don't know. You know what? I, mean, it... I, I could look back to the DSM, but my guess is those rates are based on who presents to treatment. And oh, well, that's that would not be, yeah. that would not be representative because usually people go to treatment because they've been caught. So, um, yeah. and, and certainly, I mean, you know, it, it would be very rare that I meet with somebody who was harmed by a person who was an adult when that client was a child and that person went to jail or that person, again, because most of these kids do not talk about this. They do mm -hmm. not tell anybody until they become an adult. And so it's very unlikely that we would know perpetrators. And and then, of course, in, in Christian contexts, uh, we, we have this fear of scandal and of gossip. And so we can look past things that seem uncomfortable because we wouldn't want to talk about a person and assume something's wrong there. So, th so there are ways in which that can uh, bracket and protect some of these people. Now, here's the other thing though, is, is, is some of this can happen peer to peer, right? An older mm. child, a step sibling, a cousin, a babysitter. Um, so, so it's not all pedof people with pedophilia, right? It, it's, people who have their own uh, disorganization and their sexual mm -hmm. development in some kind of way. So this can be an older child who was exposed to pornography early and saw something there and tries to recreate it with a younger child mm -hmm. uh, who, who may not develop into a, a pedophile, but may develop into a person with a pretty severe sex addiction, for instance, or mm -hmm. something like that. So, mm -hmm. so that's another assumption we make is that we it's we would know who the person was who had pedophilic thoughts, which I would argue we we would not in most cases. Um, many people have been duped in that. And then we also that we would be able to um, protect against those things because these these individuals are adults. We would snuff them out and um, 
and, and that it's not going to be your cousin who came over, you know, for that summer and was so polite and was so kind. No, no, they would be odder than that. They would be weirder than that. And um, that fails to account, I think, for the exposure to pornography early. That is another catalyst for kids acting out what mm -hmm. they've seen or kids who have experienced their own uh, sexual abuse and then are simply uh, trying to communicate that actually through uh, showing that type of behavior and playing out that type of behavior with somebody else. I've heard, and it makes sense, and it's actually frightening, but like that churches and Christian environments are actually um, attractive for people that want to groom kids because it gives you a lot of not only access, but a lot of times churches, yeah, they think the good of people or whatever. Like if somebody comes in, and you can kind of easily dupe people in these contexts. I don't know. Like, I, I yes, is that true that, that this is kind of a that, that churches can be a draw for? pedophiles people wanting to groom kids i mean i don't want to freak everybody yeah. out i also don't want to say like i don't know like keep keep your wits about you and have really good policies and don't just let everybody mm -hmm. have anybody without a serious background check have access to kids that's right that's right yeah yeah we're we're slowly catching on to this but sunday schools daycares school environments you know uh, coaches of sports teams mm -hmm. are people who uh get to, uh, by virtue of their role, have a uh, closer accent, access and proximity to kids. Mm -hmm. And if a person is um, experiencing pedophilia and is not interested in managing that in a healthy way, uh, they will seek out those environments. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and I hear about those things from people with those experiences and, and the people harmed. It's that they put themselves in positions of authority uh, where they're going to be able to have access to children in an easy way and where they're going to have opportunities for one-on-one -on -one exchanges. And this is where, you know, we're starting to see again in, in different organizations like Boy Girl Scouts and Girl Scouts, like, okay, we're, we're going to have two adults present with, right. uh, with children. We're not going to do this one-on-one -on -one uh, in the Catholic Church, we've seen this with priests where it was, oh my gosh, how wonderful that this priest has been mentoring my child and uh, all the altar servers, right? And it's like, it's totally embedded in the community that this is a good thing. And I, I even talk in the book, biases against people of, like, we assume males are perpetrators. And so mm -hmm. babysitters who are girls, we don't think that they could harm a kid because they're mm -hmm. a woman and women don't do that. Well, some women do perpetrate. So, you know, being mm -hmm. uh, aware of those blind spots and um, being able to, one of the things I mentioned is if an adult seems to think that they have a right to your child mm. and that you ought to trust them with your child and um, they don't feel like they have to earn that. And if they seem to like your child more than you do, <laughs> then that is uh, something to just take note on and to mm -hmm. be aware of. It's not, you know, obviously that means they're a perpetrator, but no, you're just kind yeah. of paying attention, eyes wide open. And that's, uh, I want us as adults to be awake to where mm -hmm. we are in society and how unwell we are on a, uh, from a sexual perspective that there are more people who will um, engage in um, inappropriate kind of sexual expression, I, I think, than ever before. And um, mm -hmm. in my my understanding, the early exposure to pornography seems yeah. to have a bigger part to play than we would care to admit. That is, I mean, that, that's, the, that's, that's a key point, right? I mean, early, ex and, and pornography, as I understand, keeps getting more and more violent and aggressive and BDSM-ish. And like, it's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's, it's bathing humans at a very young age in very unhealthy sexual practices that has to tweak our, that has to affect our sexuality on some level. Right. I mean, that's so then oh, the yeah. 17, 18, 19 year old kid who has been, you know, marinating and stuff for several years, like, I don't know, like that, that that's statistically, that's got to produce some really negative behavioral effects. I mean, Oh yeah. I mean, I've heard of people, you know, people <laughs> who are not, pedophiles, people who are, um, yeah, just kind of healthy enough sexual mm -hmm. adults who, um, have been super curious after being exposed to pornography mm. that had bestiality about bestiality and have, have had these kind of intrusive thoughts of like, 
do I want to have sex with an animal? And, and they're like, no, I don't. But now I have this wow. image in my mind. And so you take what is a natural curiosity, right, that yeah. God gives us um, for all facets of life, including including sexuality. And then you take a distortion and a twisting of that mm-hmm. at, a, at a very young age. Um, and, and, and kids do not know how to cope with that. And they are often left to cope with that alone. Uh, do we know is bestiality on the rise? Is that percent? Is that I? I that's I don't know. That, that, yeah. that, that's a category. I know I deal with a lot of stuff. I, I bet people aren't going to admit it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the people who tell me have never told anybody about how that comes up in their sexual awareness and thoughts. Yeah. Um, there's so much shame ar- around yeah. that. Um, but I, but I, th- I think that people are, yeah, yeah all kinds of experiences that they just don't know how to make sense of. And I I think to myself, I would, you know, could that kid, how do I help parents be the type of parent who that kid could come to and say, I saw this thing online and I saw this animal having sex with this human and I can't Mm. stop thinking about it. Like Mm. who's the parent across from that kid and how do they become a parent that that kid wants to talk to? That would be to lay that thick of a open relationship where the kid can come to the parent knowing they're not going to be shamed, but they're going to get coached through this thing they're wrestling with or whatever that that's man. Yeah. This goes back to the very beginning of everything you're saying, like to lay these Mm -hmm. thick foundations of reducing shame so that avenues of communication are open, not if, but when they have disturbing thoughts or desires or, you know, they hear a conversation or see an image or something, um, man. Um, I do want, we haven't even touched on, um, same sex sexuality and, 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 um, and, uh, gender dysphoria related questions. So how, how do you, um, let's go back to prepubescent and your child is, let's just, let's, let's start with same sex sexuality. They're, they're expressing some kind of same sex, uh, desires, interest, curiosity at that age, from what I understand, it could be a, a genuine early manifestation of same sex sexual desires that, that may be with them for life, you know, or, or it may just be, um, typical heterosexual curiosity exploring or whatever. And especially from what I hear, and I would love for your thoughts on this, but with girls where they may experience the kind of like turn off from boys a little bit, you know, but they like boys, but they don't, but then they would much rather get a hug from a girl than a boy kind of thing, you know, and, and experience some kind of positive body response. that's not necessarily, um, the product of a in a same sex lifelong kind of desire. So I, I don't know. I, I'll <laughs> help yeah. us navigate that world with a again. I'm talking like prepubescent when when parents are noticing these things being manifested. You know. Yeah. So th- so the idea uh, in the first book is really it, it's just one chapter on all of these experiences, and I'm trying to help parents. Uh, signal an ability to talk about same-sex attraction and to talk about gender distress or gender questioning Mm -hmm. uh, in a calm way, right? So a non-reactive way. If all that kid hears prepubescently uh, is a kind of flippant remark when Mm. a commercial comes on with a gay couple, then that kid is going to learn something from that interaction about mom and dad's ability to meet them there. So whether it's a transitory experience of attraction, as you describe, right? I I felt warm inside when I hugged this other girl, or it's a persistent orientation. Uh, What we know in Christian context, and this comes out of Mark Yarhouse's research um, with milestone events, right, is that kids are not telling their parents until much later in Christian context than they would in secular context Mm, about same-sex attraction. So by the time they're disclosing, it's 17 or 18. Well, they're experiencing first awareness between 10 and 13. So that's a big gap where they're going to make a lot of kind of decisions about who am I, who am I drawn to, do I date, before they ever bring parents in. So my mind was, how do we help the parents talk about LGBT people more broadly in such a way that would show readiness. So, so I, and then in the teen book, I actually spend a whole chapter talking about attraction for this reason, because Mm. teens are not dating today in in, we're I think 20% of teenagers have a dating relationship. So 
teens are not really dating, but they are experiencing attraction. And usually what parents talk about and spend time on is dating and sexual intercourse and all of that. And so we're not actually coaching kids on the very thing uh, that they're experiencing pervasively, which is attraction in most cases, right? And so I, I try to talk with parents about talking with kids Uh, To normalize attractions, you will experience attraction. You know, many kids, if they're exhibiting any type of, um, I don't know, like uh, behavior or interests or preferences that might lead other kids to label them as gay, that would probably Mm -hmm. be the most common thing prepubescently Mm -hmm. is kids are hearing at school, oh, Johnny called me gay or Johnny said I'm a lesbian or Johnny said I'm a boy because I like boy stuff or, you know, you're starting to kind of hear these things. And so parents being able to, number one, uh, you know, account for norms, like when we have boys and girls and there's a lot of ways to be a boy and there's a lot of ways to be a girl. And then, and then give the simplest explanation for gay. Gay is a word that adults use to talk about, um, you know, people uh, who experience attraction to the same sex. And, you know, you're going to experience attraction. Maybe you already do crushes on people. Those are things we can talk about in our home. Mm -hmm. Those are normal attractions happen to everybody at some point in their life. And, and, you know, and we're, we're here to learn about that. Who do you have attraction to? What do you notice about attraction? What's it been like to have attractions, right? So these are the things that we're, often skipping uh, because Mm -hmm. everybody seems to think that that is something teens ought to just know how to make sense of. And then when they make sense of it, all kinds of ways, (laughs) parents come in uh, reactively and say, no, no, you're not really that. This is just a phase. And, you know, that's, that's what we want to avoid. Yeah. So, so, so is it the same with same sex sexuality? Is it, is it kind of the same thing? Like you're, you're basing when and how to talk to your kid on their curiosity and interest, or do you, do you want to introduce that? a little early so that, yeah, so it's not reactive or, yeah. Yeah, I I think, you know, I do think our culture is kind of helping move this along where, yeah, Yeah. if we're, if we're reactive, we're behind. Um, I mean, I Mm -hmm. I think even of one of the people who reached out to me when I decided to write this book was a friend who walked into a public library with her kid and there was a book, you know, boys can be girls and girls can be boys on, and, she texted me and said, my daughter won't stop asking about that book. And she's, you know, Mm. three or four years old. Right. So, so I I do script those types of things. I mean, I I think um, we're looking for teachable moments with kids. So if you do see gay characters on a, Mm. on a TV show, it's a teachable moment. Um, So you could just skip that. (laughs) Um, Or you could say, oh, like, what do you notice about those people? I I think those people are two men and and they're married. Do you know, what do you think about that? What have you heard about that? Do you have any friends Mm -hmm. at school who have talked about that? And so again, you're always trying to get information first. Uh, Uh, Just uh, curious, uh, what have they already heard? Because that's going to tell you developmentally what the incremental step they're going to need is from you. And it doesn't, I mean, kids don't store a lot of this stuff, but they do store your tone and they do store how you talk about this group of people. And that's a missed Mm -hmm. opportunity in Christian context a lot of times is if all they're storing is the disgusted look on the parent's face, Mm -hmm. then that's, that's, that's what they're getting from that. It doesn't matter what you say about, oh, we believe this group of people are made Mm -hmm. in the image of God. I mean, because sometimes parents say that, but their face kind of shows them something else. So, um, and I think increasingly we're going to have opportunities with family members who are in same sex partnerships, um, that, that you can talk about. And I love, uh, posture shifts work where they talk about position and posture, right? I, I actually think that's a really helpful, simple framework to use with kids that this is our position on marriage and this is our posture towards our uh, cousins mm-hmm. who are in this relationship. Is it? I always hear, you know, there's a famous statement that kids won't remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Um, yes. It sounds, is that, it's kind of a, is that kind of true though? Like, and thinking that's tone, that's posture, true. that's, yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. when, when, when kids fast forward, when kids come to see me at the, you know, adolescent phase of life and they're um, attracted to the same sex or they're asking questions about gender, uh, you know, I don't have to ask if they've told those, their parents. In most cases, they haven't told their parents willingly. Their parents have found out or they haven't told their parents and parents don't know. And when I ask what kept them from telling their parents, uh, 
they don't talk about what their parents said most of the time. They talk about what their parents did on their face when people in this community were brought up in any kind of context. And that tells me everything I need to know about what we can do better. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. All your, all the forwarded emails about boycotting Target or, you know, all the <laughs> outrage, mm -hmm. the all the out outrage on social media, you know. Um, right. Yeah, this right. is... Uh, this is what I what I I try to. This is actually really helpful because I'm trying to wean Christians off of letting the culture war categories and mediums dictate their view on these things. Because like, yeah, you can go on like you know libs of TikTok, or you can watch What Is a Woman, the documentary, or you know some of these things that that are 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 actually capturing real opinions and stuff. But it's it's it is the most fringe, the most outraged, the most whatever. And it's like, if that becomes your main lens to what you view this stuff, yeah, you're going to be, I'd be outraged if like my education on LGBT stuff was lips of TikTok and Matt Walsh, you know, it's like, right. And, and I can turn it on and say, I don't think they're necessarily inaccurate. It's just so ski. It's just so selective that it's just warping your narrative on the whole situation. And, and then when the topic comes up, it's, you're thinking of some, you know, crazy university professor that is just saying wild stuff, or you think of some doctor that's transitioning thirteen-year-old girls, or something, you know, some. And it's like, I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to put my head in the sand, but also we need to be very vigilant not to let those culture war categories be the primary lens in which we view these things. For for this for the reason you're saying, because then when our kid actually experiences same-sex attraction, or their friend does, or whatever, they're they're freaked out to bring them home to you. I mean, they're not gonna like. You know, they're going to go somewhere else to talk about, you know, how to navigate this conversation with. But. Right. And the conclusions they draw are going to be really different most times from the conclusions that would yeah. be offered in a Christian context. And of course, right, because we have signaled a reactivity and a, I would say kind of a belligerent approach that signals to them, I don't want my parents in this conversation. Right. And then lo and behold, they make conclusions that maybe you would not hope for them as a, as a Christian parent. Well, so, so if the hope is to offer a framework for sexual ethics that is, you know, coming from a, a, a traditional sexual ethic, mm -hmm. well, there's a lot we can do better. And, and the number one thing I've been saying to parents recently, to your point about social media and the reactivity that is mm -hmm. cultivated there, is we talk a lot right now about the impact on, of social media and rhetoric and culture on our teens' understanding of human sexuality. What we don't talk about is the impact on parents from the media that parents are watching. And so what I say to parents as a gut check is if you are leaving your exposure to social media, the news, documentaries, angry, scared, yeah. overwhelmed, disgusted, you are not being equipped Right. to show up as a parent. You are being equipped to show up as an activist. And maybe you're called to that, but most of us aren't. And so how do you bracket out information that leads you to have that type of emotional reaction that will not equip mm -hmm. you to do your primary job, which is raising yeah. a generation of kids? And if you do have that activist posture, it's it's going to have a reverse effect in what you want it to have. Because if you think every trans person is like trying to bust into the, you know, every male biologically male trans person is trying to bust into the female bathrooms or trying to get their way into the women's sports, whatever, then when they, when they actually have trans friends at school and when they forgot their lunch and their trans person gives them their lunch or goes out of their way to demonstrate kindness and love, they're gonna be like, well, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't matching up. Are my parents lying to me? Is this not true? Is that, and they're going to have a, almost a crisis of like categories here and they're going to go with the person that's relationally close to them. So if you don't, exactly. yeah, so I, it's going to have, and, and so many people I know that end up going much more progressive in their thinking, it's because they had a really positive relationship, uh, uh, you know, people who aren't actually LGBT, they had a really positive relationship, relationships with LGBT people that didn't match the kind of stereotype that they're getting from the culture war. And they're going to go with, yeah, they're, they're going to side with who's relationally close with them. So that's right. Yeah, if all you present as yeah. a caricature, they're going to believe yeah. the real embodied person. They're not going right. to believe the caricature at some point. Right. Oh, man. Julia, there's so much more to talk about. So I, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I've already kept you over an hour. So the, your book is Start Talking to Your Kids About Sex, A Practical Guide for Catholics. I guess I didn't even ask this question, given the subtitle. So you're Catholic. This book is A Practical Guide for Catholics. Um, can Protestant, is there something uniquely Catholic about the book? Because I don't, I don't, as I, yeah, I, mean, good I, I see this as like super helpful for Protestants. I don't see any major difference. Yeah. Really. So, so you know what? So, uh, Greg Coles actually edited the book and he, uh, <laughs> helped me make sure that if there are times in the book where there are uniquely Catholic contributions, think things like pornography and masturbation and different mm -hmm. denominations can have different perspectives on the, um, the permissiveness morally of masturbation, for instance. And so there might be a distinctively Catholic contribution in that section of here's how Catholics would think about okay. masturbation, right? Or um, certainly certain Protestant denominations think differently about gay marriage. And so that would not map cleanly. The book will come from a Catholic perspective on uh, marriage. So, right, things like that uh, won't always cleanly apply, but in the books where I do offer something that's coming from Catholic theology in particular, you know, Pope documents, that kind of stuff. I'm telling the reader for Catholics, this is how this plays out okay. just to try to uh, distinguish. And then I try to just use the word Christian more broadly when I'm talking about okay. things that universally we all uh, kind of land in the same place on. And so, um, yes, very <laughs> applicable. I've even had friends and family who are not uh, Christians who have read the book and have told me it's so helpful for them. And mm -hmm. it's it's interesting for them to read a, a Christian articulation, uh, even while a lot of the principles are, are mm -hmm. applicable to just about anybody. So yeah, don't let that scare you if you're not yeah. Catholic. Uh, it's meant to be. And Greg helped me keep it ecumenical in a way that I hope will be helpful to a lot of people. Yeah, because I, I would imagine most people reading this book will already have a traditional sexual ethic. So they would share that with the Catholic church. Maybe the only one that I could think of is maybe the masturbation because the Catholic church, do they have a, do they have a, a, a is, is it like my, all masturbation is immoral? Is that the stance mm -hmm. of the Catholic church? Whereas mm -hmm. Protestants would be much more diverse on that. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So other than and, that, and, I don't. And, uh, yeah. I mean, and Catholics among Catholics, there will be <laughs> right people reading who don't don't agree with some of that, and so yeah. I, but I think that's the one that I saw most glaringly as a, okay. as a distinction between Catholics and different Protestant denominations is masturbation. Yes. Are you allowed to put on your clinician hat and and, and give your opinion on that question, or do you have to uh, side with the Catholic stance on? the morality or immorality of masturbation or is your clinical response the same as the Catholic response? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> or question. I don't want to put you on the spot. Maybe we could talk offline. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. Yeah. I, so I'm aligned with, with Catholic teaching in just my own personal yeah. understanding of masturbation. And, uh, yet I do in that section, I think I do what a lot of Catholic writers in sexuality don't do, which is, illustrate why people turn to self-stimulation and what okay. are the psychological benefits of that for people. Um, why? Because with anything, if there are people reading who agree with a Catholic uh, vision of masturbation and want to cultivate an environment where that's not a behavior somebody's going to, you have to know what that behavior is for. You have to honor it. And that's mm -hmm. something that um, a lot of people in Catholic context who speak on masturbation don't, I would argue, don't do a great job of because it's just this blind no. This is something we don't do when yeah. we know that most people do self-stimulate um, in Catholic context and outside of them. And so for me, it's if there are psychological benefits to refraining from masturbation, then mm. how do we actually help people move toward that? Well, it's not going to be doing what we've done, which is just saying, no, this is bad. Don't touch mm. yourself. And that, right. Yeah. That, that's that. So, okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to end. I kind of an odd place to end, I guess, but a good place to end. <laughs> Thank you so much, well, Julia, for your ongoing work uh, in so many areas in this conversation, but especially this book. Again, it's uh, Start Talking to Your Kids About Sex, a practical guide for Catholics, and I'm going to add, and for uh, Protestants as well. So thank you, Julia, for uh, being a guest on Theology in the Rock. Absolutely.
This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.